without further ado, I want to get started and introduce Michael. He um, he is someone who is extremely special for us to have here. He's a dear friend of mine through YPN uh, at NAR. And he serves as senior vice president with a focus on career development for prominent properties, Sotheby's International Realty, a New Jersey-based real estate firm with 12 offices and over 500 associates. A leading professional contributing to the advancement of the industry, Michael is on the board of directors for the following organizations, Eastern Bergen County Board of Realtors, New Jersey Realtors, and Zip Logics. He has chaired various committees, including RPAC, Communications, Young Professionals Network, Legislative, and in 2016 will be the chair of Strat Thinking Advisory Committee for NAR. Michael has spoken at many industry events, including Realogy's Industry Day, and participated as a judge in their FWD Invitation Innovation Summit. And it's um, he doesn't know this yet, but I'm secretly hoping that he will come and teach CE for us here at the board next year so we can all pressure him to do that by friending him on Facebook and sending him annoying messages. Why don't we see how today goes first? Yeah. Uh, what motivates Michael every day is to learn something new about the world and be willing to help someone else do the same, which makes it um, extreme, uh, gives us the extreme honor of having him here to, to delve into this report. He also enjoys reading, playing basketball, and spending time with his family. So will you please give a warm welcome to Michael Oppler. That's me. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, before, before I get into, into the day, I, I just thank you so very much for, for having me here. Um, I met Maura a few years ago, and, and, I, and I have to say that the, the YPN group is such an exhilarating thing for, for folks like us because at times I think it's very difficult to sit in a room like, like we're doing so today and have real and honest, open dialogue and discussion regarding what things are taking place within the industry because typically we leave the room today we're in competing situations so that peer-to-peer -peer sharing of ideas just typically doesn't happen within our industry so when we get to go to these national things and I get to meet unbelievably talented people like Mora it's very refreshing and very exhilarating for me because we get to exchange ideas there's no sense that, ooh, she's going to undermine me. It's just this free flow of information that's really quite uh, wonderful, and we build this great camaraderie. So that networking at the national level has always been such a wonderful thing to find peers. So I would certainly encourage it the way that, that Moore and I have, have uh, connected, and, and, and that's just such a great thing. So we're going to spend, I guess, some time to get together today. Um, and, and I just want to go over very quickly those expectations and, and what we'll be doing today. Uh, Maura alluded to it earlier, but what, what we're going to spend is the next half hour or so going over this report. We're going to break it down, um, see what's in it, how it was created, and so on and so forth. Then we're going to break into table discussions similar to how you're set up right now, maybe a little bit more as you, as you converge and, and, and talk to one another in, in, in a more circular fashion. And we're going to have table discussions for about a half hour each uh, where you're going to be diving deep into the report, beginning to discuss those things. And then we're going to come back as a group, um, talk about them, and then uh, report really back to the entire group what you, what you spoke about. And then we'll have an entire uh, group uh, conversation for, for a couple minutes as well. And we're going to do that three times in total. So one on, on a particular topic. Uh, agents and then brokers and then the association at large. You'll also get fed is what I'm being told. Um, and, and to be truthful, when Maura uh, told me to come on down, the first thing that was out of my mouth was, okay, we can do this, but you have to take me to the Flying Biscuit. That is, that is it. Um, and, and then I said, uh, I, and then I made some sort of joke about Mercedes because I'm from New Jersey and Mercedes headquarters is right by uh, where some of our offices are, and uh, we went back and forth. So hopefully I'll be as well received as Mercedes has been recently, from what I understand. Um, you get to ship me back. You know, I'm not taking Mercedes back. Um, can't take them home with me. So that's kind of how the day will go, and then we'll have a, a quick little wrap-up at, at the end, and, and I know that um, uh, we'll, we'll likely send some sort of survey out afterwards what, what uh, Lee said, Lee and I had a few moments. He's been my host since I've, I've got here, so uh, naturally took a Jersey kid to a pizza place. Um, but it was good. It was good. 
So, uh, and, and, I thank, and I thank you for that. And we had such a great dialogue as well. Um, and, and I'm just excited to be here. It, it seems like you've got some really great stuff going on at, at the board, and, and there's some, some great momentum taking place, and that's just exciting to, to be a part of. Um, and that's basically how the day will go. So let's uh, also, before we, we jump into it, um, I think it's reasonable to set some sort of expectations for yourselves or your own goals. Because if we're going to spend time together, um, I want you to get something out of it. And, but I can't create that for you. So if you can take 30 seconds in, in your mind and say, OK, I have to be here. What are my expectations today? And, and that way, we can reflect back on it and, and figure out, OK, well, did I achieve those? And maybe why didn't I achieve those later on? Or maybe I need to dive deeper into this particular topic, or I'm not as well uh, uh, researched on this particular thing. It, it seems these people knew this, and I didn't know that, or so on and so forth. Or your expectation could be, I got some emails to work on. And if I'm going to be here, I might as well finish all the emails and not pay attention to what's going on. And that's perfectly fine. Set realistic expectations and, you know, Achieve those goals. That's fine. So whatever it is, take, take a few moments in your brain and figure out what it is that you want to get out of the next uh, our, our time together. And then we'll be able to reflect back on it. Because I think that's helpful. Having these great feedback loops is how you create momentum within the board so you can refine what's going on and make sure that what you're doing is, is progressing and evolving in the right way. And that's the reason why I hope you do the survey as well. Not because I, I care what grade that you give me. Um, I truly don't. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it's, it's certainly really useful for the committee to understand uh, how, how this day was structured and what you can get out of it and how, how we can all improve. And I take that back. I care a little bit. <laughs> all right. So what is the danger report? It's this beautifully bound, very evocatively named thing. It's an acronym that I'm not going to read. De Definitive Analysis of Negative Game Changers Emerging in Real Estate. But the danger report, OK, on purpose. It's named that way. If it's something that's so dangerous you don't want anyone to know about, it, you wouldn't name it the danger report. So this is all very purposeful. And it was commissioned by the Strategic Thinking Advisor Committee, uh, well, really NAR. Uh, to start to identify some threats that are in the industry, industry phenomenon, if you will, that we can all uh, fixate on as organized points, 50 of them in total, broken down into five categories, 10 in each, and start to look at these things. Now, you could call it a SWOT analysis, if you're all familiar with that, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This just happens to be a threat portion of it. So. There's no solutions in here. There's not meant to be. It's just meant to be a resource or a tool that then you can take and use in a fashion like this, or in your own brokerage, or at a board of directors meeting, or in a few uh, a variety of other ways for your own personal uh, growth um, that you can use. So it's certainly a resource. Um, the gentleman who is in charge of it, Stefan Swanepoel, I, I, I don't know if you, he's unbelievable. Uh, and what a pleasure to work with, um, just truly top notch. And, and what he also did in addition to you know, 7,000 or so surveys was he interviewed 70 of the top CEOs, people that he have on his uh, you know, top 200. So the, the likes of the Spencer Raskoffs to Dale Stintons to uh, uh, you know, anyone you can imagine. So 70 in total, um, trying to extract some, some thoughts uh, out of those and then crystallize them and then refine them into, into overall dangers. Uh, Bob, Bob Hale, I'm sure he spoke, spoke to, Ginger Downs, and, 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 and so many other folks uh, from around the country. Um, and, and purposefully, the, the report was written with uh, anonymity. Because sometimes, if we're to have a dialogue, we're, we're to sit, we have our biases. And if someone is speaking something, we at times are biased to it because, oh, this is this person. They're coming with this perspective. So it was writ written with total anonymity so we can focus more on the ideas rather than who it's coming from. And I think that was really a, a well thought out vision by the committee to, to allow people to just really look at the material and the content and not so much as where it came from. Um, so wanted to get the perspective of others. Um, and of course, that's always helpful. 
and once again does not suggest or propose any solutions. Now, as I said in the forum and I, uh, back in DC, I occasionally, if you know me, I just like, like to quote old Greek philosophers. So I, I had a little bit of an issue with doing this, even though this is the strategic thinking committee. It's not the strategic solutions committee. And that bothers me. So one of these quotes that I said you know, from Cicero is, to warn of an evil is justified only if, along with the warning, there's a way of escape. So it's challenging for me to like put and help and orchestrate these things and identify all these problems and then just sit back and say, OK, now what? Um, but that's not what we're meant to do. So you can't really expect that from NAR. NAR is not going to put out something and say, and this is how we solve the problems. It's just not the purpose of this. Um, and, and in so many ways, you're already so familiar with all the content that's in here. It's just been refined and packaged and merchandised, if you will, uh, to, to organize points that you can say, oh, no, I know what that is. I get that. Oh, I have that experience. I had this anecdote, yada, yada, yada. But it's been written so clearly that we can just go through these titles, and we will very quickly, and you'll gravitate to these concepts, and you'll know them inside and out. But it's nice because then we, that can be a catalyst for conversation here today where we are on the same page. Um, and, and granted, we'll, we'll veer off at times because that's the nature uh, of, of group discussion, group think. But all in all, it's, it's written in a way where we can converge on topics, try to stay focused on that topic, and grow and go deep into the topic. And, and that's, that's what we'll find today. Um, and, and really, in this room, you can build solutions. But you, know, you have to think, all right, well, what are you even building a solution for? This is just us coming together developing, I guess, as brokers or whatever other hats that you're particularly wearing, um, and then go from there. But you know, solutions are, are a dime a dozen, um, and, and you'll bring your own perspective. And that's kind of the, why I said, or started uh, from the beginning of, you know, what are your expectations? Oh, I want to bring back two great things for my agents. Or I want to learn more about this topic I don't really know enough about. Um, and that's, and that's basically the purpose of it, is to stimulate conversation. So the danger report in brief, if you open up to basically any page, you get this nice two-page fold. Kind of looks like this very quickly. The name, security breach, we know instantly. We're already starting to think, oh, that must be Target. That must be Ashley Madison more recently. And so many other interesting things out there where security is an issue. Um, so you'll have a title. You'll have a brief description. You'll have a little bit of background, a little bit of the author's comments. But it's all very objective. Um, and then this PTI scale, which is just some clever, fun methodology that says, OK, here's the possibility that it can happen. Here's maybe the timing. And here's what the overall impact might be. What was really uh, well thought out as well is you can go on to dangerreport.com, and you could customize this entire scale and say, ooh, well, I don't think this is important. Or if I'm a broker, or if I'm the head of this or that, um, you find, OK, well, this is my primary th uh, danger that I want to be prepared for. This is the threat that I think. And then consequently, you know, OK, well, then or where these opportunities exist. Or I can take this and say, oh, let me pitch this to a bunch of investors. I think there's a great product that could help our potential industry and innovate, and we can, and we can move on from there. So that's kind of how every page is laid out. It is extremely readable. Um, I haven't read it. I'm only kidding. But, um, but it is I heard it's extremely readable. Uh, no. Don't tell anyone. That's not on, uh, we're, we're videotaping the session? Ooh, OK. I get, that's, we'll talk about that later. Dad, talk about that later. No, um, <laughs> jeez. No, I was, I was telling Maura, I got a text message from my uncle, who I speak to very, very uh, inf infrequently. And he like, works for the Department of Homeland Security. And he sends me a text. And he's like, great video. I was like, great video of what? And he's like, oh, you go into Atlanta? I was like, what, what do you mean? So I, I, it took me a while to like, find the board page and the YouTube channel. I was like, there's been six people that have viewed this. It's not exactly a viral thing here. How did you find this? And he's like, you don't want to know. And I was like, OK. <laughs> So that's, that was the, the, the joke. So I guess, yeah, if I screw up, the only one who's going to know is my uncle in the FBI or whatever he does. We don't even know. He's like some fictional character and some, and some like, I don't know. I don't even know what he does. 
OK. So, and the ranking of the danger, right. So this is just very objective. Um, Stefan and his team and, and us saying, OK, this is in order based upon this PTI scale, what we think is going to happen in the next couple of years that is of, you know, of importance that has some sort of impact. But when you think of looking at dangers, or you think of looking at threats, or what Stefan is typically known for is, is this black swan presentation. And, and, and I don't know if you know uh, what that is, but basically it's this philosophical notion that there's uh, white swans forever, and then you meet a black swan, and then you're like, oh, the inherent property of white swans, not all swans are white, therefore falsification, and, and it's, it's this whole thing. And the only way that you prove things is by falsifying them. So you can't predict everything that's going to happen in the world. It's just not feasible. And there's these big cataclysmic events you know, that, that are going to happen that, yeah, security breach won't matter if we get hit by a meteorite, obviously. You know, and neither will any of the other things that are going on. So you can't predict everything. There's obviously things that, that uh, are, I don't want to say left out of here, but just reasonably speaking, um, this is industry specific. It's not meant to be comprehensive or completely exhaustive. It's just meant to stimulate a little bit of conversation. So this is how it's organized, uh, broken down into five sections. Um, and I'll read them out because I think, I think that's probably the best time to do it. So, 10 dangers for the, the agents, and you'll, you'll know these titles right off the top of your head. We have the number one listed as masses of marginal agents destroy the industry reputation. By the chuckling, I think we already have an, an, an idea of what that means. Now, how do you quantify that? How is that? You know, that we could talk about forever. And when you kind of look at what's coming up the pike with more agent reviews and metrics and this is and that's and all these sites pushing these sorts of things, we can, we can have such a deep and meaningful dialogue regarding what that means, what is the reputation of the industry, how does that impact our relationship with the consumer, does that inhibit our ability as a board or organization or brokerage to have some sort of meaningful impact, yada, yada, yada. So we could go deep a as can be, but I'll run through these a little bit quicker. Commission spiral downward. Agent teams threaten the survival of brokerage. The IRS forces exodus of independent contractors. I think we keep seeing things in the news about uh, these things happening where employee status versus independent contractor status, you're, you're starting to hear th court cases pop up. We're looking at these big companies like an Uber and so on and so forth that are hiring independent contractors. And what does that mean? Are we in that class of you know so on and so forth? Uh, the decline in relevancy of agents, interesting. The agent-centric error ends. Housing finance system fails. Commoditization of residential real estate. Commissions concentrate into fewer hands. And the agent is removed from the transaction. Uh-oh. Now, it is, it is the last one listed there. I think we could talk about that for ad nauseum. I think we all kind of know, based on what we do, even a robot wouldn't want to do what we do. <laughs> Let's be serious. Wait, you want to do what? You want to answer your phone at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday? I don't, no, no, take me off the clock. Un unplug me. Um, so I think we have an understanding of, of what it is. Um, and that's the dangers affecting agents. And we'll talk more about that in our discussions. Dangers affecting brokers. Regulatory tsunami hits. Ooh, very, very timely, I think, with what's going on uh, and all the new, new regulation changes that was going to happen and now it's pushed off and this and that and responses to Dodd-Frank and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we had to hire a, a, a general counsel at our company just to really think and be prepared on, on how to do these things. Paper brokerages cause disruption. I think we're all kind of seeing these things as well. Brokers lose control of data. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, it's our data and we want to pack. Say sayonara to your data. It's gone. Okay, you have no control over it. You never did. If you think Big Brother is this big imposing thing, too bad. It's already been collecting data on you for a long time. You're never going to get it back. You're not going off the grid. Okay, even if you do something on your computer, let's be serious. It, it's it's out there and it and it's not coming back. So it's the same thing with our real estate data. It's out there. It's becoming public knowledge. You can whine about Zillow and their datas and the Zestimates, but guess what? Their data is going to continue to get better and so on and so forth and, and whatever the case may be. So 
brokers lose control of data. That's already happened, in, in my opinion. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll move on. Consumer brand crashes the party. Very interesting. New business models go mainstream. Always, always an interesting threat for brokers. Brokers simply go broke. If you're in brokerage, this is the question that I think you ask yourself every single day. Am I going to go broke tomorrow? <laughs> and and that's that's what would keep me up at night. Uh, and it, and it does. So I'd put that a lot higher. But nonetheless, technology becomes a runaway train. This is something I think we'll talk a lot more about later on. Uh, for sale by owners develop a do-it-yourself model. Um, the sales tax threatens margins, and portals leverage lead gen dominance. All right, dangers affecting NAR. De Decision-making structure becomes a hindrance. The three-tier structure liability. Our, uh, we're outpositioned as the industry spokesperson. Mission creep, the catch-22 tech quandary. The quality versus quantity challenge, which if you, uh, this is a conversation that's been going on for so long, we can expect that it will continue to uh, take place. Insufficient new blood, a shortage of leadership talent. The realtor brand loses its desirability and power, and then core standards are too low. And then, so the fourth section is state and local associations. So we, we kind of found, right, if this was being commissioned report, there's a lot, of, a lot more focus on associations and it made sense to break them up. Uh, state and local associations. So leaders not in unison with a fast-paced world. Too many uninformed decisions are taken. Broad resistance to consolidation. The lowest common denominator impediment. The unwieldy governance structure. Reluctance of leaders to step up. Loss of primary revenue source, changing of the old guard, local association charter revoked, and the dues disconnect. Wow. All good ones. Um, we're not going to talk really a whole lot about the MLS, but I will say um, just recently with, with all of the stuff that has taken place with Upstream, this is, you know, this was something that I would say I wasn't shocked by so much. I just never spent a lot of time locally thinking a lot about the MLS. It was just there. It was a service. But I, I think that, that there's been a lot of now recent discussion uh, going on and, and really evaluating these things. Um, but we're not going to talk a whole lot about it today. But it was a vastly interesting subject uh, at, at national between the, the, the circles just with what was uh, transpiring there. So entry by a new player, unclear end result. Control of a national MLS, decentralized infrastructure becomes obsolete, a large patent troll attack, um, and I know that there's a recent call to action. So if you saw that, respond to it because these things are important um, when it when it comes to uh, patent trolls. Security breach, which was the example, and that's always a fun topic to talk about. Um, off MLS listings escalate and increased hostility in the real estate community, and consumer-facing websites, uh, websites at the crossroad, and a better mousetrap. Now, a better mousetrap, what that kind of means is, is very uh, analogous to entry by a new player, that the services are restructured. Sure. What is the increased uh, hostility in the real estate community? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, we feel it every day. <laughs> Increased hostility. Well, let's let's look. Let's look. This is what. Let's see what it says. Today's rapidly transitioning marketplace becomes a growing source of controversy between brokerage operations, big versus small, franchises versus independent, local versus regional, branded versus unbranded, and 100% versus traditional. So I I think. Just an overall concern. Uh, by by the the real estate community saying, you know, hey, we don't need you. Hey, we could do this on our own. You're charging us exorbitant fees, and and we can't really have a, a support. We can't support the brokerage model and be profitable uh, going forward. Um, so I could see how how that takes place. Or you know, why should we have two MLSs or six MLSs? I mean, th these are things that are all throughout the country, and and even feel uh, things that we experience at times in our own market. You know. If we're just spending all day, you know, inputting data into six different systems, what does that mean? So I think that in, in some ways that that's kind of what it is. Um, 
Is that, is that clear? Sure. Great. So moving on. Now, this book, yeah, so you have the 50 dangers, nice and color-coded by those five categories, agents, brokers, the National Association, local and state, and then the MLS. But at the back of the book, it has it re-ranked, again, ordered, then some survey data, and whatever. So this is, the, that's the back. You can certainly, like I said, go onto that website and play around with these things. There's certainly things that I would say are more important to me in general, but but this was just the perspective that Stefan and the committee was getting as an overall, uh, I guess in a repetitive nature, these were things that just kept coming up that, that need not be ignored. So top 10 dangers in all, you kind of see that, um, as Moore mentioned. Uh, and I know that uh, Lee is going to send out some follow-up stuff, um, you know, how to access these things. But that's where it is. Um, and like I said, you can create your own little sliding scale and, and have that report digital for yourself. Um, it is certainly nice to have, you know, the, these these bounded books, but but you know, you can get them online digitally, print them out, you know, for your offices, whatever the case may be, and, and kind of peruse these things. So um, recently I know that Lee and and more, I think you were at this this retreat. So this dialogue's starting to happen, but as, as we, we kind of know, it takes time to move through the association. So I would say this this board is certainly on the forefront of having these important dialogues. I mean, to cut together basically at the end of summer, um, when this was just recently put out, is I think a great testament to what to what you guys are doing here, uh, and and just very exciting. But they had the leadership summit, and you can kind of see where it all was going. So it's happening um, all throughout the country, and it will continue. So what's next? I think, like I was saying earlier. The committee's reviewing the report as, as the strategic thinking committee um, will develop responses, blah, blah, blah. But I, like I said, I don't think that there's a whole lot that needs to come from NAR anymore. The, the meaning of this is, is a resource. And, and however, whatever hat you're putting on that day, because we're all serving in different capacities, and we all have to think, OK, this perspective to this member, this member to this member. I'm a broker here, but an agent here, I could see. And they're all inexorably intertwined, I think, what we see. And that's what makes these conversations so difficult at times, and why I think this report is so valuable, is we can spend time on this particular topic and try to stay focused on it and go deep. Because I think oftentimes enough, we're not going deep enough into these, these issues, these problems, to try to find the, the meaningful solution. So, Develop responses, I, I suppose, but it doesn't. You know, I, I know th these are these are things that have been around some of them a long time. You know, the the quality versus quantity challenge that's been here since day one in so many ways. Um, the tech problem is just accelerating a little bit more now so than before. But this is going to be things that are systemic, I think, uh, and will continue. And I don't think we need that sort of reminder from NAR. Um, but, you know, we'll have the forum and we'll do all that stuff. So if you come to these things, that's great. I think we'll probably be doing a webinar, but you'll get more out of today, I think, than that webinar, uh, which will just kind of be this high-level stuff that I've just kind of uh, showed you. So before we get into uh, our discussions, uh, where we'll spend about 10 minutes or so, like I said, 10 minutes with your little group discussion. So if, you know, you want to go here and this and that, um, just kind of jumping into a few of the, the, the topics and dangers. And then you'll report back to me. So I'll be somewhat uh, looking at the clock a little bit um, and, and floating around, making sure that, the, that we're having healthy conversations. Um, so we'll do that in just a moment. But there's a few things I just want to uh, lay out as far as how these discussions can operate or, or be meaningful. And it all comes down to. Um, well, I guess what's what's healthy when it comes to strategic thinking and, and the best way to maybe get to a, a particular place is, is there's a difference between what is called convergent and divergent thinking. So if you don't know what that means, convergent, coming together, uh, you're judging something, you're analyzing, you're choosing it, you're comparing it, you're selecting it. So after you've diverged, oh, I'm going to explore this further. I'm going to observe this. I'm going to imagine this. I'm going to do that. What really we find is if you 
diverge and, and continue to try to diverge. Oh, let's think about this a little further. Let's explore that. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's go deeper. What you find is that when you converge back to something, it, it really makes for the right way to do things. But, but at times, we're so overly focused the way that I am with that Cicero quote is, oh, let's get to the solution. Let's find the answer. Let's do this. Let's do that. And as I said in the forum in DC, um, I love this quote by, by Einstein, is that if he had an hour to save the world, he'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes looking for the solution. And this really smart engineer, but I can't think of his name, he says a problem well stated is a problem, well, is, is a problem half solved. So when you think of that stuff, you know, we, we try to, we diverge, we only go a little bit, and then we very quickly come back to converging. Okay, now we can do this, 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 and this. And we probably haven't spent enough time diverging down a particular road. We haven't gone deep enough into a particular topic. Because if we had, they wouldn't be issues. They would have been solved. And, and that's really the, the thing that, that I think is helpful to think about. The other thing um, that, that I hope that we do is we stay away from the yes but syndrome. So if you have uh, you know, spouses, significant others, and you ever say something like, I love you but, you're in trouble. Um, no personal experiences here that I'm going to share with you. Um, so what you might want to say is, I love you and. It's the same thing here, that when you get into this yes but syndrome, it's just not healthy dialogue. It doesn't suggest this divergent thinking. It doesn't stimulate that. Now, we can all agree, yes, we're in competing situations at times, the, the people in this room. But if, if we calculated everyone in this room compared to the rest of the marketplace, you would only make a small fraction. Is that correct? Does that make sense? So it would behoove us from time to time not to come together as this small fractional group and think about these things open. But that's why I also suggest some of the national stuff and the peer-to-peer, -peer, because there's no sense of, oh, they're going to take my best kept secret. So it is difficult, but we, we definitely want to have this healthy dialogue and think about going down these particular roads and not say, yes, but we tried that and this didn't work. Or, um, oh, let's get a committee to think about that. You know, th this, this, or we tried that before and it didn't work. Uh, we, we've, we've always done it this way and we're never going to change. And then that gets back to the, the, the old adages about change in general and, and how change works. And, and we'll go back into a little bit more Greek uh, philosophy. Uh, Parmenides and Heraclides, one guy said, change is impossible, change never happens. The other guy is saying, change is always happening, it's, you know, all the time. And the quote that it's attributed to, to Heraclides is, you know, uh, you can never walk into the same river twice. You know, neither the man nor the river is the same when you come out, that sort of stuff. It's very, like, bizarre. But, um, but there's a lot of truth in that. So in some ways, you know, I'm typically probably more of a subscriber to things are changing all the time. But you can go both ways with it. I don't think Parmenides was saying things don't ever change, but maybe more the problems are there and they're not changing. Something more along the lines of that. So that quality quantity challenge, it's not that it's not changing, but it's changing. But how is it changing and is it really changing? It's just you, you kind of get into these ways of thinking. So at times it's good to see that perspective like, oh, that's the way it's always going to be and it's never going to change. Or is it changing and there's a room, room for improvement growth? So just be aware at times of what side of the fence you're on. Like, well, I've been doing this 30 years and it's not going to change. I work in a brokerage where my father's the principal um, and he's been doing it 30 years. It's funny because he reminds me now that he's the average age of a, of a realtor. Right? He's 58 years old now. He's average. That's what he's been saying to everyone. I'm average now. I'm like, I could have told you that. But nonetheless, it's, it's very interesting that he's been doing it for 30 years and now oh, he's, he's the average realtor. And these dialogues that we have are kind of funny because occasionally I'll get this very cynical, fantastic answer from him like, well, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know this. And it's fun um, and, it, and it makes for lively conversation. Uh, within the brokerage and it's, and it's good because we're never, you know, there's never this sense that we're undermining one another. It's always for the good of the brokerage. Um, however, we get into these yes but syndromes and that's, that's really quite a challenge. Um, so just be aware of what side you're on there and that can open up your, your, your mind 
to more uh, to more things, and that's basically what this whole se uh, session is about. So I think we can we can move into our our groups now, and like I said, what I want you to do is spend that 10, 12 minutes or so, um, and and I'll be monitoring coming around. Is I want you to go into the agent section. And I want you to talk about these dangers. Um, probably focus not on all 10. Try to find two or three as a group and just start creating some conversation. I know this will take a little bit of time um, to, to get going, but I'm going to put this back up on the board. If you don't have a report, I'll come around and have at it. All right, all right. How quickly did that time go by when you're talking about some really exciting stuff? So we're going to bring your attention back up forward. I know that you could go on and on about the agents. I think that one's the most fun for me to talk about, uh, think about, describe. That's who I get to interact with the most uh, on the day to day and is, is quite, quite fun. I, we're going to go quickly around. Um, maybe 30 seconds to a minute each table. Vanna White will be bringing the microphone over. And just, uh, you know, whoever wants to grab the microphone and just give a quick synopsis and in a very converging type manner, collect all those divergent thoughts that you had while you were at the table, exploring this, observing this, and condense it uh, and analyze it and, and report it back to us, and then we'll have this, this nice group dialogue going forward. So go, go for it. So you're confined to 45 seconds. Okay, good. Thank you. OK, so um, we, we tried to cover kind of all of them. And we, we feel like we did a pretty good job of that. They're all certainly intertwined. Um, but I think the two biggest takeaways that we had were the conveyance of the value proposition. Like there's always going to be, we think, that marginal agent. But there's just almost no way around that uh, beyond Big licensing, maybe big government regulation, which none of us really want, but that almost could facilitate that. Um, but we really just felt like conveying that value proposition um, is a big overlying factor in a lot of these. And then also similar, the um, independent contractor piece, um, we kind of skipped past the IRS mandate of that and talked about the idea that if maybe everybody was an independent contractor. Maybe if you did bring somebody in as a staff person or in as a paid employee and educate them or mentor them or do something with that, then that actually would lead to a better long-term scenario than just hiring a bunch of people and keeping the four that are, that are OK Great. or that are good. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. When people think, when the, when the consumer thinks that real estate, real estate agents are a commodity, what happens to the commission? What happens to our brokerages? These big box companies come in and they're te and they have all this money for marketing and they're telling all the, the public that real estate is, you know, we'll sell your house for X amount of money and you don't need these agents. After a while, people start believing that and then we become a commodity. When we become a commodity, the real estate commission. You know, obviously, there's a lot of other things involved, like Rick was saying about you know issues that happen and lawsuits that happen with these, you know, because of, of this. But it, it's it's a fact that it could happen. And then the question becomes is, what's the difference if you're a realtor or not a realtor? I mean, people don't care. It's a commodity. You know, it's salt to salt. You know, you buy one salt, you buy the other salt. So we we talked a lot a lot about that and going past just the book right in front of your face, but maybe down the road, ten years. As far as what it's going to look like. Great. That's great. 
And it's not actually down the road because Lowe's just partnered with Solo Pro. So what does that do to your Lowe's Realtor benefits? And they're using the Realtor name in their marketing on our website and we're giving them all of our clients into their database and what's going to happen with that? Who's at this table? Hello. Uh, we talked about marginal agents and we recognize that's a problem and so we immediately delved into solutions right away. <laughs> um, I think all of us know, have enough experience with untrained agents or new agents or agents who are part-time or agents who are not committed to developing a uh, real estate as a profession and they know the impact both to the public and we know the experience of dealing with one of those agents on the other side of the transaction. So we left right into solutions. Uh, we came up with four. Uh, one of them is increasing the educational requirements to get a license. Um, I, I sit here and think that my barber has more educational requirements and more on-the-job training than I'm required to have. And there's something wrong with that picture. Um, I pay my barber $15 and nobody would ever accept a $15 commission for selling a house. Um, another one we came up with is some sort of interim requirements between getting your initial license and getting it renewed the first time. Some sort of demonstration of competency that justifies you continuing to hold your license. Another one is we looked at the broker's responsibility in this. Um, if the state is not going to raise the requirements, then we as brokers have to be more involved in training our agents and being in, engaged with them so they, de they develop the skills that we want all agents to have. And the last thing we came up with was actually a sort of a legal mandate or a regulation so that brokers are more res are held more responsible for the actions of their agents and if that happened I think we'd be a lot more engaged with our agents. Thank you. Uh, All right. Over very here. good. Thank Who's you. Talking? Tim? Yeah, we um we sort of talked about three covered three of the different topics. We talked about uh, teams and then we talked a bit about the agent removal from the process and then the marginalized agent. And really with teams, it came out to be, uh, one of the things we were looking at is how the team is actually a danger to the brokers because as the team gets larger and more powerful, they tend to try to command more of the resources um, and try to maybe not follow the rules or follow the guidelines that have been set down by the brokerage. And from an individual agent perspective, how the team gets more attention or more uh, more of the resources than say an individual agent because the team has five people closing you know five hundred thousand dollar houses a piece whereas as a you know a, a younger agent you may have one house that's 250 and you feel like well the team's getting you know monopolizing the printer or the office people are spending more time with them than they are with you or that kind of thing and then that kind of led us into talking about the removal of the agent and we were talking about millennials and how people are starting to look for houses in different ways um, you know people are finding their own houses and then just asking us to take them to those and one of the things that Mara brought up was that really you know it may not be our job to showcase the house more than to help people through the process so as the process gets more difficult that's really our value is to help those buyers and sellers make it through the legal pieces of it and educate them to the process and help them through that process. And then we all sort of agreed that um, the marginalized agent, if things kind of go this direction, that may take care of itself because if you've got people like you're saying just picking agents, right, if I can pick anyone and this person's not doing a very good job, and I look on Yelp and I can see that they're not doing well, but this person over here is, then this is where I'm going to go. And so it's how people are, are shopping and how things are changing. Great. Great. Okay. Who's talking? Okay. So to piggyback off of what was just said, we are also talking about agents being removed from the transaction as well. Um, ours per se is how they will get the information from Zillow, um, Realtor.com, other sources. <coughs> 
um, one of the things that we discussed is having to consult with our um, our buyers, you know, our agents, to educate, to let them know that Zillow is a syndication, and their syndication is coming from our source, which is the Georgia MLS and FMLS. So they're really getting third-party transaction information. So, you know, as a value and keeping us as a value just to educate them of where the source is coming from. Um, we, we, <laughs> we took a completely different approach to this one. Um, no, the, we kind of just dealt with a topic as a summary. And at the end of the day, it's dangers impacting agents, not dangers impacting realtors. And the consumer, we all know the consumer does not know the difference between a licensee and a realtor. And there's nothing that we can do individually to change uh, the consumer's perception of what we do to alleviate the risk. Yes, individually, each one of us probably has high standards for our offices and our companies and our own personal business, but that's where it ends. And, and none of us have the resources to go out there and try to re-educate re or inform the consumer about the differences and what the dangers are. So the question really came down to is what, as a local board with all the, the politics that are played there and the National Association and all the politics that are played there, what is what are what are the boards doing? What is the NAR doing as far as um, ch el eliminating the danger or reducing the risk, um, showing and by showing the value? So there's a, a lot of conversation around that, and, and where is the leadership? Where is the leadership on the, on the solution part of the conversation? Great. So. Thank you so much. That's great. Amazing stuff. Um, and, and we could spend so much time discussing any one of those individual points. Um, and, and that's what I think is, is likely required to, to make any, any sort of progress. Um, what, what I heard or have heard many times, um, just to summarize for, for my own perspective, value proposition is just an incredibly important one. Um, the value proposition we tell ourselves versus what the perception of the consumer is, uh, our relationship with the consumer, what they perceive to be our value, and all of these things just central to what's going on. And then when you think about change, uh, I stole this from this professor, um, that in order to change, you have to change twice. You have to first change the perception, and then you actually have to change the reality. So when you perceive something, and, and to change that perception, it, it often is a shock to the system. So you've seen something your whole life, like that black swan thing, and you know, boop, your whole thing, your whole thing is reversed. Now, for consumers, um, to change the perception on the difference between a, just a licensee and a realtor, um, I agree with you, is, is completely not at the level that we all wish it to be. Um, and how does that get solved? It's, it's, it's a phenomenal question. Um, you know, there's been, uh, you know, consumer outreach and all this stuff, but, but what is maybe the root of, of all these issues? What is the root of all these problems? And how intertwined are all of them? And, and they truly are. There's no simplified, well, this is it and, and how it's going to, how it's going to go. Um, the, the word commodi commoditization is such a such an interesting word because um, it, it just it reminds it reminds me of something that that I put together once you know as far as our value proposition is concerned where if people will continue to be people which they are and everyone's unique and Every single property, if you believe every single property is different, which, well, it has to be, because if it was either one property there, there's one property there, and they're all different. Yes, I know in a high-rise building they're very similar, but they're still different, right? Um, and every circumstance is different from time to time. So your situation today and putting together a deal today versus tomorrow, based on how human nature is, there will always be some element, I think, to the transaction that is unique and can't be commodified. 
unless we denigrate that value proposition that we're offering to say, but we're not offering anything unique. We're not distinguishing ourselves well enough. Therefore, there is some sort of you know, way to, to disintermediate us from the entire process. And, and that's, that's always the, the thing that, I, that I'm trying to think about. And I heard some, some great conversation here. Where the world is going is, is, is very much in regard to transparency, right? And the consumer drives everything for the most part. We're seeing this great consumer revolution, uh, and, and that's just how the web works, for better or worse. So how does that play into the whole thing? So just any, any additional thoughts, comments, we, could, we can pass around the, the, uh, the microphone if, if anyone just wants to say anything else before we move on to the broker section. One super quick thing. Yeah. Table. Oh, I really need that. But one of the things we talked about at our table too was, was that the commonality of these problems and the fact that they were having the same conversations 30 years ago. So whether that means that it goes right back to your is changed that is changed right. is not changing the fact that it's still the same problems or is not changing the fact that we aren't doing the right things. We were just starting to touch on the issue of inaccurate information out there with Zillow and Truly and all that. Um, just give you an instance, you know, listing, and it was still showing 10 years ago with the listing sold and was not pulling up my active listings. So things like that, um, a house I sold has, has two bedrooms, it's, a, it's a, a two bathrooms, it's a five bathroom house, you know, those kind of things. But that all comes back on us from the buyers thinking that information is coming from us. And so how can we get that corrected? Talk loud. Give me the mic. One thing that we were discussing was how um, builders, um, some builders are not putting all of the information into FMLS system. So, you know, if you're going in with clients, you really can't gauge in terms of where the numbers are because the information is not available. And then also, once, you know, you go under contract with the builder, mm -hmm. the builder starts communicating directly with your client, you know, in that transaction. So you almost lose yourself in the transaction. You really have to be on top of that and make sure that they're including you in all of the correspondence right. on new construction. No, I, I think that's such a recurring theme uh, is, is this information uh, and, and where our value proposition probably lies. So for a long time, it was we were the gatekeepers of information. If you wanted to see this house, they had to come through you. Um, and you had the most accurate information. But now, because information has been uh, available on the web, it, it, it changes our value proposition. If we don't ascend, if we don't embrace that, so if you look at uh, what the journalist uh, Eric Severide from a, many years ago on black and white TV, you know, described as the, is the um, wisdom hierarchy, on the bottom lowest value proposition is information, then it, or excuse me, it goes data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. So if our value proposition has to mean something, it has to ascend where we're just not these purveyors of information, but we, we, we facilitate the transaction in a more uh, advisory sense, a more consultative sten uh, sense, uh, more from experiential knowledge. Be in the same way I heard this table discussing WebMD. Now, you're not going to do an operation yourself. You're not going to, I mean, I'm not cutting my hair myself. I know it doesn't look that good, but I'm not doing it because I'm expecting an expert with, with years of training to do that for me. But if someone thinks they can do it on their own and they can get the information on their own and they don't need you, it's very interesting. So where does our value lie? Where are we positioning ourselves uh, as an industry to say this is what we need? So whenever I hear this, it's this our data stuff and we want it back or we want to control it, it, it speaks to me that we're not understanding what our true value actually is, perhaps. Um, and, and that has to evolve. And I, I want to tell two quick stories. Uh, Two annuals ago, I had the distinct pleasure of, of uh, presenting with, with the former CEO of Realtor.com, uh, Alan Dalton, who's a friend. Um, and as we were walking out of the session, Jim Weikert, I don't know if, 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 uh, if you know the name, unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable businessman. You have Weikerts in the area, correct? 
Okay. So he started in New Jersey, and, and I'm sure their franchise is down here. So they ran into each other. They know each other from back in New Jersey. And it was amazing because, and this is why Weikert is so incredibly <laughs> successful, is what he said is, thank goodness that the transaction is becoming increasingly complex because if it didn't, we wouldn't have any value. Whereas the rest of us are all thinking like, oh, I wish this would just get easier, right? It's not. Why should it? And that's just it was very enlightening to me the way that he, you know, the way that he said that and positioned that. Thank goodness it's getting harder. Who wants to wake up and think for things to get harder? You know, more complex, more difficult, and that's where the ascension of value uh, proposition enhances in, in that. And then the other thing that was interesting, it comes back a little bit to commoditization, what our value is, and so on and so forth. Is thank good, and this is what Alan said: is thank goodness everyone um, wants to, you know. Every single person believes their home is better than it is, because otherwise we'd be transactional brokers making twelve dollars, like on E Trade, and the process would be commoditized. Because if everything could just be priced perfectly, you know, even though in the book for economics it says that a hundred percent of realtors or licensees overprice their home, well, why? Because why wouldn't you try it at a higher price? Isn't that the point? So, you know, what is our value? Is, isn't our value to try to extract as much money for the client as possible? And then on the other side, which is always so interesting and perverse to me, is that as, as selling, we're probably the only profession that is trying to sell someone, someone sell somebody something for less. Where does that, where does that ever happen, right? So it's, there's so many things that are miscues. And then the other thing is we're, we're, we're oscillating back and forth between being a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. We're losing the sense of it. You know, you're not a prosecuting attorney in the afternoon and a defense attorney. Someone sticks to what they know and they, and they stick to it very well. So it's just very interesting and enlightening. But I had to tell that to the, the stories that thank goodness the world is becoming more difficult and more complex. And thank goodness people want you know, to have someone appreciate their home and pay as much for it as they, they would because we wouldn't have a profession, we wouldn't have an industry. So let's jump into the brokers uh, section and this will probably take us all, all the way uh, to lunch. So jump into it in the same fashion and, and then we'll kind of do this, this uh, recap again in the same format. So um, jump into it, brokers. It's probably the easiest thing and there's probably be some crossover like I said, the easiest way to do this, look at like these table of contents, flipping through the page is not going to be easiest. You're going to know these titles off the top of your head. You're living and breathing these things every day. All right. Let's bring that attention back up to the front. Finish those last thoughts. Write down those gems. All right, Maura, you want to start? Back of the room. Let's start back here this time. Who's talking? Thank you. So we talked about a couple of these. Uh, let's see, paper brokerage causes disruption. Um, I don't think we have any proposed solution for that. I'm going to move on. We actually um, spent the most of the time talking about the FISBO develops into a do-it-yourself model. and. Uh, we don't think that this is a major threat, and they didn't have it listed near the top, but we were just equating um, a lot of the things that we've seen um, just with, again, with information being so readily accessible now, how like uh, somebody now, if they, if they don't know how to make something or if they aren't a creative person, they can go on Pinterest and get step-by-step -step instructions for how to do just about anything and make it exactly like somebody else. It doesn't take creativity or knowledge or expertise um, because all the information is laid out there for you to to copy what someone else has done, and how um, that could potentially you know be a threat, and how there are several companies now that um, almost have a do-it-yourself model where you, where you pay them a fee and they put it in an MLS for you and they provide the forms for you, but then um, you know the seller really doesn't have any knowledge, but you know, we think that that's somewhat can be damaging, even though it's an alternative to the consumer. It can be damaging because, you know, maybe they don't know how to market their home. They're really not being represented. Um, the agent on the other side is doing double the job. And in the end, the houses may not be being sell sold for as much as they could be sold for it. So in the end, you know, that uh, seller 
is paying anyway because they're not going to get that price for their house. So we just we don't like the model. Thank you. Great. My favorite blog posts are the Pinterest fails, you know, where <laughs> they show the professional one and then they show the attempt. And my favorite listings are the ones that are listed by those companies that call an, a realtor after that when they fail, when they have their do it yourself or fail. Who's at this table? <laughs> okay, um, so we talked about a couple different things, but the two that we really focused on uh, are the, the technology becoming a runaway train and losing control of data. And, and really with the technology, I think it comes down to two different models. And of course, you know, you're talking all the way from enterprise technology. As a brokerage, do you say, okay, we're all gonna use this CRM, and we're all gonna use this type of phone, and we're all gonna use this type of laptop, and it's kind of like the Apple model where I know what you need, whether you know it or not, and if we all use the same thing, then I can give you the strongest tool that you can use. Or do you use the more open source Android kind of model where there are all these tools out there and people use what's best for them? And really it comes down to a philosophy of what your brokerage has. You know, is, is, do you want to control all of that or do you not? And where do you put your resources? Because at the end of the day, you can spend a ton of money tracking down all these subscriptions and jumping from one system to the next and that kind of thing. And so how do you, how do you plan for that and how do you move forward? And then also, when we were talking about losing control of data, we were, we were in agreement with you where the data's gone. That horse is out of the barn, right? Information wants to be free, and it is. And really, it's a matter of controlling the, not controlling the information, but teaching our agents and as brokers learning how to manage the information and teach our, our customers that we work with how to assess information. Uh, I was a librarian in my former life, and so we've talked about this for years since Google came on the market. You know, how do we how do we do this? How do we educate our users on what is the best data stream for you to use? And so, how do we do that, right? How do we say to our agents and teach them to tell people, okay, you really want to use this and educate them? And so, we had a, a sort of a long conversation around that as well. Um, does that kind of sum up what we did? Very good. So Zillow is to the MLS what Wikipedia is to researchers? Yes. Over here. Okay, we basically touched on everything. Uh, so, and I think, I think the, the main thing was uh, we're all going broke, by the way. Always um, have, always will. Yeah, and so I, I think two of the major things that we discussed was uh, one of the things is, is most of this has to do with bringing it to the professionalism of our agents. All these things touch on that. Um, a lot of the mainstream, uh, mainstream um, business, new businesses going mainstream are really impacting our business. Whether you know it or not, it's coming. We can't, we can't stop it. Only thing we can do is make sure that our professionalism, our agents, our brokerages are where they are. Um, individually, we have to pay more attention to the regu regulatory uh, tsunami, what they say is coming. Um, it's already here. There's no, it's not coming. We have to make sure that we are getting our, 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 our stream of revenue is coming into our businesses. And, and that is in our agents, that is in our ancillary services that are attached to us, that is all the things that are, that, are, that are playing a part in our new business models. And I hate to say it, but yeah, this all started coming 30 years ago, but it's here. We have to start setting up our new model. You may think that, okay, I'm a Remax, Remax broker, my model is what it is. Wrong. It's what it was. So with all of, all of us talking here about what we can do as far as agents, uh, technology being runaway train, it is. Um, another thing was uh, we talked about was the, uh, the uh, let me see, hmm. FISBOs. We talked about people, people that are out there doing their own business. We didn't specifically say FISBOs, but the individual uh, out there wanting to sell their own properties and, and taking our, our agents out of the business. Um, it all plays the same part. We have to let everybody know how I hate to say the word but important, but yes, how important we are to their transactions and to everyday real estate. So that's about it. I think everything else. Very similar, similar to what um, they were just talking about. What we discussed at our table was also that as brokers, our biggest threat is ourselves and that we've got to start getting back to explaining our own value added to our agents. 
uh, as brokers, we're too quick to get the numbers and hire anyone that comes in the door and not, you know, providing the training, the educating, you know, educating them, um, going through scripts, counseling with them, um, and providing a service to them. We're seeing a lot of discount brokers uh, pop up in the market, and I think a lot of that is because they don't see the value added. You know, what are we spending in advertising versus what an individual in your company is spending? And then the other thing, too, is getting back to um, figuring out if we can, you know, want the reputation of a doctor or a lawyer, we've got to have the education of a doctor and lawyer. Um, I think it is um, ridiculous that you can get your real estate license in a month. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more follow-up. I think that I'm very happy that the local Atlanta Board of Realtors is trying to push more education and changing the test to make it harder because I do think it needs to be harder because that's how we're going to prove our value added and that's how we're going to get younger people joining real estate. Right now, according to the um, uh, Realtor.com, only 6% of people under 35 are entering real estate and that's going to kill us right there if we can't prove our value added to get younger generations involved in real estate. That's great. Yeah, we, um, a couple of things we, we touched on, the first and the last actually, was looking at um, the Zillows and Trulias and that kind of as, as business models or legion sources. And one of the things we recognize is that Zillow and Trulia have a different master than um, the MLSs or Realtor.com or anything like that. They're serving the public. You know, so they're giving the public what they want. The public wants estimates. The public wants big pictures. The public <coughs> wants all those things. Right. And as real estate agents, as broker owners, you know, ancillary service people, um, we're not giving the consumer what they want. So that's really the threat. It's not the threat that they're there. It's the threat that, that we're not giving consumer what it is that, that the consumer wants. Well said. Um, which kind of leads, leads backwards, though, into the regular the regulatory tsunami. We actually want one um, because the Zillows and Trulias of the world and those kind of things, they're not regulated. So they take our data, they put it online, and then they never update it. So we've all had situations where you, you may close on a house and a six, what was it, six months later somebody's knocking on the door saying, can I buy you know this house for sale? Well, no, it's not. Well, yes, it is on Zillow or Trulia. So we're looking forward to some regulatory, regulatory tsunami primarily coming out of the CFPB is most likely where that's going to come from. So if we, if we can set that expectation with them, that this is, it's not us, you know, we're not screwing over people. It's this entity over here that we have no control over once they've taken our data. So That's great. Some of the most interesting discussions I read in the NAR group is, why isn't NAR making Zillow and Trulia follow the code of ethics? <laughs> well, because uh, they're not realtors. All right, so in, in the name of Tom, I'll be short and I'll be very different. Because our, our group got, um, I don't want to call it derailed because I think it was good. We got we actually started talking about um, what I would simplify as a hybrid model of us shifting into kind of like the idea of the big box taking over, but that being us. We kind of went from the Home Depot to maybe the Starbucks to maybe the idea of what you know we used to all see as, as floor duty. And just that idea of being present, but maybe not being present in the same way that we always used to be. So I guess really what we kind of fixated on um, was a solution. Sorry, I know we're not supposed to be coming up with any solutions. You can, tell, but, you can do you know, whatever you want. We did. Um, so we, we looked at the idea of these, these Rome type places and the, these temporary office places as both a solution to the expense of the brick and mortar and then the flexibility of kind of what the current agent wants. So I guess the overview of that is just kind of the hybrid brokerage model versus um, trying to worry about going broke or any of those things, but more moving in a different direction. Yep. It's unfortunate that the word brokerage has the word broke in it. Uh, oh, 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 oh. oh you're, you're a singer, a comedian, an educator. I'm here all week. I see that. Much to their dismay. So every table had, a, had an opportunity? Okay. So the answer is they, they don't own them. Move owns them. And in reality, uh, um, News Corp purchased Move and all the, the arms that, that are there. They're, you know, not that I've ever been privy to those documents, nor will I ever. There's things that I think NAR has to talk about, approve of, yada, yada. Um, but 
you know, it's a publicly traded company. So they're, you know, back to what we were saying, they're, um, they're have to be loyal to their stakeholders. And this day and age, that means being loyal to what the consumer wants. And that's always so fascinating. And that's what I, what I hear at times in, in the room. And um, we hear, and we, we label these, these groups as the, these third parties, right? And I know that we, we've heard that you know, countless times. But to label them as third pa parties diminishes their value at times because they're not just third parties. They're the first point of contact. And, and, to, and to downgrade them that, you know, we, we underestimate what it is that they're doing. They're media companies, it's, it's as simple as that. And it, it, it got me thinking back to uh, something that came out of a couple of years ago with Google. They, it's called uh, the zero moment of truth. And really the whole thing is, is you, you have to respond to the consumers and you're not really competing with anybody. You're just responding to the consumer's needs. So I agree with you. I think that it, it's long overdue, you know, as the pendulum swings back and forth between you know things regulating and uh, you know going back and forth that's healthy and it's important and it's kind of how our, our society has has operated um, in, in so many different ways um, kept hearing technology that was that's a buzzword it's been around for hundreds of years I had to look it up like the you know the word's been there for a long time innovation it's been there for a long time these are words that aren't changing really right but that maybe they're accelerating a little bit quicker. Maybe the fact that there's going to be billions of more people coming on the web in the next 20 years dramatically shifts everything. I think it will, and I think it does. And, and what does that mean to the overall brokerage? What type of services are we looking to provide? I think, I think all of these things are so unbelievably intertwined and so complex that, that it makes it just for, for, for great dialogue. I think what is interesting, though, is with this technological revolution that we're going through is that you can expect that anything that can be automated will be automated in years to come. Um, so if we focus on things that, that can't be automated, like consulting with people and, and being able to handle uh, and have greater emotional intelligence and, and, and all these other things that you, you only learn through dusty old books for the most part, but yes, you can start to learn these things online as well. Um, those, uh, that's where I think there's a lot of value. So just expect that anything that can be automated will be automated, and maybe what we then need to think about is um, augmentation, meaning that how do we take things that are automated, augment it to better serve what it is that we're doing and whoever we're, we're meant to be serving in that uh, capacity. I, I, it's just... Wildly fascinating stuff. We could spend so much time on this. Um, it's tremendous. Um, any other additional thoughts before uh, we, we, we grab some lunch? Just to say, in regards to technology, good. No, we need the technology. Because this is technology. This is, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to say, in regards to technology, I think the future will be having in house uh, software developers. Um, to create exactly what the consumer wants. So if you look at Urban Compass in New York, who has now changed their name to Compass, they're and so they're going right. into Miami and DC, yep. they see what the consumer wants. And now Real Estate Webmasters is modeling their websites after what, they, what they're doing. So I think that's going to be the trend. If not having those people in house, it's going to be exactly uh, who do we outsource to to create those things mm -hmm. and to capture those people. So we're the first point of contact versus right. the lower trillion. So, so what's amazing is how do you provide goods and services without the research? So if I were to call any one of your brokerages and say, can you connect me to the research and development department? What, what, what answer do you think I'd get? So, what, what? But every major corporation, every major company has, a, has an R&D team because how do, you, how do you serve the public without R&D? You don't. And, and you look at the amount of money spent at some of these large corporations on R&D, and you could say it's not justified, but of course it is. I mean, how else do you innovate? How else do you uh, focus groups on top of focus groups at, the, at all these big companies? Um, and, and, and that's the only way to do it. So we think, we think we're like serving the public here, but if, if it would be embarrassing to look, to look at what we do in terms of looking into what the consumer really wants, I think. 
And then my question off of that is, do you think as an industry we're depending on people like Zwillow and the people we buy our software from to do our R&D for us, and then we're reacting to that? So we're being reactionary instead of proactive, and yeah. they're actually driving what we do instead of us driving the market. That's a great point. Right. So the services that we're looking to purchase, whatever the case may be, are these just interlopers looking to extract dollars out of, uh, out of what seems to be a, a, big, a big pile of money and saying, oh, we'll carve this away, carve this away, carve this away? Or right, are they serving to say, oh, this is why we're doing it, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, that's a great point that we, we probably have to examine further as brokers to say, OK, this product coming to me, is it just another redundant tool, um, or is it value added? our business could ever be 100% automated and just going off doing business uh, since 2008. A lot of consumers are also frustrated with technology and they call, you know, wanting to deal with people. Everybody's not digitized and I don't think it'll always ever be like a 100% digitized, digitized preference, you know. So I think we'll be okay on that and just knowing how to market to those people. Right. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that, that the, the transactional experience will, will dramatically change. And that's what I keep seeing and hearing. Everything is experientially driven. That's what we, we want to have, uh, or at least what we crave, or at least what you know, the demographics show. Um, however, if we, if we examined every element of the transaction, and, and I think that we would find lots of inefficiencies. So elements of it could be automated and then reserve certain you know, parts of it that would always require. I, I think so. I think that there always has to be some sort of human touch um, available. Um, however, I think that there are certainly things that, that get unbundled. And, and, and that's how you kind of see where the investment's going. And you look at how heavily funded like a compass is, and all of the, 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 the capital that's being injected into our business, and you've got people from, you know, uh, from the Warren Buffetts to um, uh, uh, News Corp, um, what's his, uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch, you, you've got big players that, that see this as, as a potential way to, to open up uh, for more profitability for their stakeholders. So there's no question that, that, that these things will uh, continue to be examined and researched, and, and it's just, too much fun to talk about. So let us if it, grab that lunch and please sit right back down. And then we're going to do one more discussion. So grab that lunch, take a few bites, and we're going to jump back into it. So five minutes, seven minutes, get back, back to up seat. again. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying lunch. I hope uh, if you see someone at your table that's got some lettuce in their teeth, don't tell them. It's funnier that way. OK? You can't take them seriously. Only kidding. All right. So we're going to transition into a discussion regarding associations. Um, thought that this would be an interesting topic uh, to talk about. So in, in the report itself, it was broken down into uh, NAR and then state and local. But for, for our purposes today, we can conflate the two sections uh, in, into our uh, discussion. So. Take a little bit of time, dive into those. I know that there then a, there, there's a lot then to, uh, to digest in a short amount of time. But I think what we're starting to learn today is we're just beginning to scratch the surface in so many ways that each one of these would warrant so much more time, research, and, and thought um, that, that we could spend the rest of the day here. So um, and, and probably you know another six months. But we're not going to do that. So, Jump into there, have, have some discussion. We'll bring you back in, in about you know, seven to 10 minutes and, and, uh, and share our thoughts on that. So jump into the dangers. All right, all right. I know we were limited on time, but that's OK um, regarding this particular section. So let's go around. Uh, my, I have a new Vanna. Lee, this time will be my Vanna. Um, so let's start at this table right here regarding 
your thoughts. Um, so uh, based on this, I'm actually a visitor to this board. I'm a part of a different board. And talking just about leadership in within the board um, and maybe um, reluctance of leaders to step up, I sort of see it in the leadership uh, at the leadership level down. I don't even understand what a benefit would be. Basically, it was, hey, you get your license, you're a real estate agent, you have to join a board with our company. So I joined the board. Um, my form of communication maybe is, hey, this is going on, this is going on a random email where like Lee reached out to me and I'm not even on this board. Hey, this is going on. So uh, proactive kind of from the top down is important. I think relux reluctance of leaders to step up maybe is a time thing for some people and an uneducation no education of what the benefit is and how we can um, really utilize this in our favor. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Are you passing? I am passing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to go in order because I'm only smart enough to go in order. Thank you so much. Well, the first topic that came up at our table was that the, the dues disconnect and that members of the board really don't know why they have to belong to the board and why do they have to pay these dues, and they, therefore you get some pushback. But we as a board have, to, and I think we are doing a very good job, but we probably have to even do it better, is to show our members the value. And we do send out wonderful emails and communications, so I think that our board is. But we also brought up the fact that in Georgia there are 50, 54 different boards. And while we have the largest board in the state of Georgia, we have a lot of power and we have a lot of, we have a fabulous staff that communicates and helps us as leaders. But a lot of associations simply are lacking in that area. And so a lot of members do not know the value. But we also talked about, you brought up how important the Governmental Affairs Committee is and how they are really working for us to save us money and to, and to put more money in our pocket as agents. We have to get that point across. And also, the board, in my opinion, offers the very valuable service of having the uh, Professional Standards Committee where there's a place where you can go for ethics and arbitration and mediation hearings, which I think is extremely important in this, uh, in this business. And our board has that, all boards do, and that, in my opinion, adds a lot of value. And those are the things we mostly talked about. Thank you. I think we can just mimic what Ms. C said <clears throat> concerning the dues connect. That that was the predominant part of our conversation. And then stepping outside toward the NAR issue, the three-tiered uh, connection that we have with uh, state and national, and for a board like the Atlanta board, we provide a lot of services that GAR does not even begin to touch and so is there going to be pressure to take a look at that alignment of forces uh, y'all guys are going to get here, tired of hearing me talk so um Never. but in any event i think the way we discussed it and we talked a lot about the same things that they did but we kind of looked at it as really you know, all of our brokerages are like a microcosm of the board. So where we have to recruit agents and where we have to uh, do a value proposition to our agents, then the board should do that or needs to do that with us, right? So how do we reach out to a diverse group of people in a wide, a wide range of ages and bring them in and make it an inviting environment, you know, not only for the agents who are maybe a little bit older, but also the younger people, right? The the twenty year old guys who are out there, guys and girls who are just getting their license and, and making it inviting for them, because they really are the emerging leadership in our industry. And also looking at those people in our industry who are leaders but who may not be active and trying to figure out why they're not active and how can we reach them and bring them in as well. Because for as good as we are, we can be better. And so how do we make that better, right? How do we do better recruitment for the board? How do we do that? How do we make those dues that everybody pays really hit that value proposition? And so um, for us, it was really more of a, a how do we step up and increase and, and make things better as opposed to um, 
maybe you know how good things are, but how do you want to make it better? Right. That kind of cover. That's great. We had, well, the big thing that we were talking about, too, was that also um, when people do come and say, hey, you know what, I want to join a committee and I want to be a part of the board, that we need to ensure that we are making them feel, feel welcome, that we are smiling, saying hello, thank you for coming, we're so glad you came, we would love to have you come back to the next meetings because a few of us here at the table said that was the experience that they had. When they came, they, it was not... They did not. They were not made to feel welcome. And um, I know when I first came, it was a little bit like that in the first meeting. And so, of course, once I, I mean, that was years ago when I first started getting involved. And um, so, just making sure that we're doing that, and we are in, in embracing everyone that comes to serve. <laughs> so, great. Okay, um, our group examine the cost factor from 7,000 Georgia agent that that could be reviewed. A danger impact in the state and association, we should, um, we all agreed that we need to raise the standards of the, of the and the qualification of agents. Um, part of it is to add our agents to the association, you know, make sure that they join these association and just continue and step up training. That is what we agreed here at our table. Yeah, I threatened not to, and I said I had to. Um, we looked at this a little differently um, with a pretty heated discussion back and forth. Because I'm, I'm on the side of the board does not have value. And everybody else at my table is on the side that the board does have value. So uh, that was fun. Not necessarily. OK. But to the point, the, the, what we were talking about is when you look at the threats that were identified, um, the, the the boards exist. They're self. They're kind of a um, not to put too fine of a word on it, but they're kind of a self-important, self-aggrandizing self organization. Self uh, yeah, they yeah. exist because they exist. Right. And I know on the committees that I was serving on, I stopped serving on them because the committees that I, that I was serving on was were making very direct, strong recommendations. To the executive committee and the executive committee just said mm, no thanks. So I stopped. Um, so in that conversation, talking about leadership not stepping up and um, you know leaders not leaders leadership not in unison, we actually had a, a thought that perhaps the leadership roles here are too short. That with when you have presidents and vice presidents right. and committee members changing annually, it's not enough time to really set anything into motion before you're starting over the next year and then you're starting over the next year and then you're starting over the next year. Right. So there's also no consistency of vision or mission. That, that we could espouse that said this is the vision or the mission of the board, which is kind of an interesting thing to say for a group of brokers mm -hmm. as to how come, you know, what's the value, what are we what are you trying to accomplish? And then we realize the real world where you're dealing with 54 other boards, if you raise a standard here or you raise a cost so here, the agents out there in the third go, well, I'll just go to DeKalb. Well, I'll just go to West Metro. You know, there's, 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 so there's no, so from an NAR or GAR standpoint down, there's no minimum standard even that the boards are trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not talking about leveling the playing field, but you know, you've got to, you've got to, we've got to figure out a way to say to the agents, if, if you can't convince me, how am I going to convince my agents? And that, and that really is the struggle. Right. The, the AR Thank you. Cool. That that was great. Um, so so many great points were made, and I think that the, your last comments were were very interesting and, and, and honest. You know, we, we have to continuously be justifying our worth, whether we're agents, brokers, this model versus that model, the association at large. And a lot of these dangers, I think, speak to exactly the conversation. You know, what is, what is our value? Why do we matter? And, and these are things that we have to continuously be focusing on because then you don't improve in, in, in any way. Um, it kind of relates back to, I think, what you said a little bit earlier regarding uh, explaining to the general public what our value is. It's, it's, it's very analogous. I, I see it that way. And I think it makes all the sense in the world. You, as a membership-driven organization, you're confined by those parameters at times to say, we're membership-driven. We need to make it more welcoming, this and that. And that comes with unintended consequences. I think 
many of us remember some of the uh, public awareness campaigns that suggested you're busy this weekend, you know, let a realtor sell your house, which suggests the alternative that if you weren't busy this weekend, you could do it yourself. So that doesn't exactly speak to an industry that has great skills. It was a recruiting message. That's clearly what it was. So if you're a membership driven organization and you want to recruit folks, that, that would be the correct messaging. But now you have all these things in play and you start to have to think about it a little bit more clearly. I think the, the, the messaging has certainly stayed away from, from that overall, we want more members, come join us, to you know, contact a realtor for yada, yada, yada. I think we're going to see more of that in, in the consumer awareness uh, campaign that suggests that what we do is a little bit like uh, herding cats at times and that we have discernible skills and we're just not uh, service oriented business. And I think that's where a lot of this kind of comes into play or, 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 or wraps up in a way is that you know you can't get young talented folks to want to join an industry that is the service sector. And we self identify as the service sector from time to time and no one who just spent a ton of money on education wants to go into the service sector. They want to go into a skilled sector. But if we're positioning a certain way, it, it doesn't uh, lead to an infusion of, of, of youthful talent. There's no value. There's no, well, why am I doing this? What am I here for? Blah, 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 so on and so forth. So there's, there's no question and there's no shortage of, of issues here, but nothing that I don't think uh, can't be worked on, solved. And, and, and in some ways, the greatest weaknesses here are also our greatest assets at times. And that's something that we also have to be cognizant of. The fact that we are big and bulky from time to time as an association is a great thing, and it's a bad thing. It's the same way I think of it as, as Congress set up. You know, Congress maybe is the opposite of progress from time to time, right? Pro, con, that's the joke. And it's the same thing with the board of directors at times is it's very large and very bulky. So then at times, unless you get consensus from a big majority of folks or the timing's not right, you're not going to be able to just have these sweeping changes. So that has pros, it has cons, it's led to an environment that, that is now in place for better or worse. Um, however, I think that there are such important value in, in some of the things that we do that can't be understated. And that kind of plays into what this report is all about. There are certain things in here, and that kind of is going to lead to like our wrap up of the day, is there are certain things in here that we cannot predict or, or we can't solve. These are things that are just going to take us along. If there's something that's past you know, regulatory, you know, besides our incredible work that that uh, the folks in, in the uh, Realtor Political Action Committee do and the lobby that are serving our interests. Um, you know, it's very difficult for, for us to have a say and, and, and dictate anything that's happening. But there's things that are going to be happening that we can't account for. So it's just maybe incumbent upon us to focus on maybe the few things that we can, try to solve them, try to fix them. And, and I think what we kind of found today was, um, you know, we, we could pick one topic and have a follow-up session and, and spend all day on one of those elements. Granted, we would probably understand that we would stray into other things and, and, and it, 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 it lead to a larger conversation. Uh, but this is only the beginning of progress for, I think, this board, the folks in this room. And it, 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 I think it was interesting. So did we achieve our goals today? Those things that we said a little bit earlier that we said to ourselves, I know Maura, uh, her goals were she had to get a couple emails done and, and Facebook, right? Um, only kidding, more. Just yeah, just just get me yeah, just get me to the airport. Um, is this is this report already obsolete? I don't think it is. I think that it's a framework for for progress. So yes, the fact that these things are things are happening in the news or whatever the case may be doesn't uh, you know doesn't discount that there are issues looming, and this is just a framework and structure to help help you do that. But yeah, if I was at, I'm asked to speak on a panel at, at the AE Institute um, to talk about the danger report. There's no reason for me to even come close to preparing for it until like a week in advance because the world will dramatically change between now and March. Um, Lee's going to send a survey just to make sure that, that uh, this day was, was meaningful and, and we can progress. And for the most part, I just, you know, I, I, I thank you so much for your kind attention. I know Maura has a few things that she would like 
to say, uh, but I strongly encourage you to continue on this process from your own perspective and wearing different hats as you do it and do it from the sense of, you know, with purpose and, and, and shifting back and forth between deductive thinking and inductive thinking, convergent thinking and divergent thinking, perspective thinking and prospective thinking, all these things that help you refine things as opposed to just, here's the problem and now it's solved. It's not always that simple. Um, it, 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 it takes a long time to, to solve these, these important things. They're very complex. They're very difficult. And that's, that's, all I'm, I'm, uh, that's all I'm prepared to say today. So thank you so very much. I know Lee's also going to share my, my contact information in that email. So if, if, if you want to communicate afterwards, I know Lee and I will be communicating afterwards. I think we found a lot of commonalities between what we do. So it's very exciting. Thank you again so much for having me. Um, and, and, and congratulations on having such a great board. Thank you, Michael. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Please don't take the books. Please, I'm begging you, please don't take the books. You can get them for, you can get it for free online and it's t totally customizable. Lee's coming around to pick them up. We have 14 of them. Um, a couple of quick things. Lee is, send, uh, the, Jen just sent out a survey. It's already in your email. Please fill it out. It's only five questions. It's pretty quick. We want to know what you thought of today. We appreciate you coming and sharing. I know that's sometimes not easy when you have competitors in the room, um, but we appreciate it. We want you to um, fill us in on what you would want for future broker events. We would love to have this twice as many of you in the room next time, but we want it to be valuable. We want it to be worth your time, and we will feed you. So, I mean, you know. Um, and we want you to also keep keep an eye out for the professional development emails. You get them just like your members, but we offer six free CE and six free non-CE classes a year. We bring in amazing national speakers. We have a budget now to do that. Um, we do RE Bar Camp. We hope to bring Tech Edge back with NAR possibly next year. So we have a lot of offerings for you and your agents, and we don't mean to be competition for what you offer in office. We want to be complementary to what you offer in office. So on behalf of Lee, who is your professional development chair and Victor who is your broker liaison on the committee thank you for your time today fill out the survey and have a great day